so I guess just to start off, uh, it's amazingly clear that Martine has been able to so successfully blend her personal passions with her professional passions. Um, however, in today's society, we often hear that there should be more of a, a much clearer distinction between our personal lives and our professional lives. Pretty much leave work at work and have a very active social life outside of work. Um, so we've already heard your, your, your names and your current titles, but I want to hear a little bit more about your story. And um, as you're telling us a bit more about your story, can you also answer the question of, do you think we should have such a clear distinction between personal and professional? And if so, if not, you know, what does that look like? What it, what is, where does that combination, what does that blend look like for you? So, sure. Open that up to the panel. <laughs> I'll start. So I'm Tina, the founder of Cardboardigami. And um, just to answer the question first, I think uh, for me, when I integrate my personal life with my career and with my profession, um, so many more doors and opportunities open up because um, I'm doing what I'm passionate about as opposed to segregating like my life into work and not work. And so, for example, in 2007, um, while I was at the USC School of Architecture, I designed a portable shelter that's called Cardboardigami. It's made out of cardboard folded into an origami structure, and it's developed, I designed it with the intent to help the local homeless community, as we most probably know we are the homeless capital of the U.S. We have the most homeless people in L.A. than any other city in the U.S. And um, as a student in architecture, I decided I wanted to do something because that was my passion, right, personally, to help people and to not see people ignore people who are having to live on the streets for whatever reason. And I integrated that with my education. I was able to develop a product for for that. And to go further, after I graduated, I started a nonprofit where we've developed a program to help get people reintegrated into society with the use of the shelter, but with collaboration with other organizations to do that. Thank you. I'm Jessica. Um, I'm a little bit more of an entrepreneur at this point in my career. I started out um, as an activist. And as a wilderness trip guide in college, I was uh, very passionate about sustainability. And um, coming out of college, I started working as a second employee at a nonprofit that was, uh, had a mission of setting the boldest greenhouse gas reduction targets in the nation, one community at a time, and working with those cities and schools, businesses, to establish reduction plans that were scalable and could be taken up to the state level and to then to the U.S. level. And uh, coming out of that experience, I really got into communications and how do we work with individuals, whether it's a policymaker, a student, uh, a business person, and connect with them and tell the story about why we need to address climate change and how we can work together on a solution. Um, that translated into a, a special project that I did at Princeton University where we developed a program that still exists today called the Student Environmental Communication Network, where students tell stories about sustainability that connect the school to the broader society. Um, and at the time, I was ready to come to um, grad school, and I wanted to get onto the business side of sustainability. Um, and so I came here to UCLA Anderson and um, studied corporate sustainability and marketing. And now I work at Southern California Edison where I've had a lot of really great experiences working on our electric vehicle policy at the state level. And now I manage our social and digital communications team. Uh, and it's been a great experience because it's about how do you, you know, take this vision for a better future and everything that you've learned about the science, the policy, what it takes to make a difference, and translate that at the individual level. And so I love how digital communications allows for that connection and allows for us as a company that's a responsible company to actually connect with our customers, give them solutions, listen to them, get them involved in conservation, um, in connecting their electric vehicles and connecting solar. And uh, so for me, I, I really feel like I couldn't imagine not connecting my personal life with my work life. I think that's just been 
the consistent thread. I remember being in business school and having a, a moment where I was thinking about just going a traditional route with, with marketing, for example. And in interviews, people would ask me, are you really up for this? Like you're so, you know, so, so, excuse me, you're so about sustainability, you know, sustainability chair here, blah, blah, blah. And um, looking back on it, I'm so glad that they asked me that question and they challenged me to find that role that matched my passion with my you know, ongoing interest in areas like marketing. So that's where I see myself, yeah. Awesome, thanks Jessica. Mika? Hi, um, my name is Mika Onishi. Um, I'm the co-founder of a pre-launch uh, startup called uptogood.org. And uh, we are about to launch in a couple of months, but what we are is, um, we are a video-based social action platform. And what that means is we power campaigns that are based on what we call impact stories. So an impact story to us is um, any short form, long form video content that has the potential to make an impact in the world. So we're talking documentaries or it could be a little video clip of someone talking passionately about something that they believe in. And what our platform allows us to do is for, for anybody to create a campaign and associate a piece of action to it. So what we've defined is fund it, which is crowdfunding, sign it, which is petitioning, and promise it is to pledge to do something really simple and clicking to promise it and to share it. And so it's this whole ecosystem that we're building. And you know, I've been at this for about a year and my former um, role was I was a president and publisher of a company called Click Media and uh, some of you might be familiar but uh, it's a media company and it's a parent company of a very popular online fashion magazine a celebrity fashion magazine called Who What Bear so it might be a little bit unexpected that I went from fashion to this social good space but um, it really kind of brings it back to this question of you know aligning your personal and professional life and aligning your values to your professional life and I've always loved fashion and so I was very grateful to um, have the role at Who What Wear and learned a ton but I found myself kind of going you know there's something more that I want to do and about two years ago I found myself watching a lot of documentaries on Netflix um, I think some of the early documentaries that I was watching was food documentaries. And I would watch it and go, oh my God, I can't believe this is happening. And I became a vegan, you know? And it was just like, I was obsessively <laughs> watching all of these documentaries every night. And, and then here I was, you know, I would go to, go to work and, you know, we were in the business of monetizing influence and celebrities and, and working with brands and, um, you know, doing all that kind of stuff. And people were talking about Kim Kardashian's butt. And, <laughs> and I'm like, wow, you know, this is, there's all this stuff going on, but it's not being talked about in a mass media kind of a way. And so I, I felt a little bit frustrated by that. And I was also very busy, you know, in my everyday life. So I found myself, besides, you know, changing my eating habits, kind of going about my life, not knowing what I could do or not taking, you know, not having enough information to know what can I do. You know, it wasn't, I couldn't kind of quit my day job and fly to Africa and save a child at the moment. And um, I know that some people do, but I was not at that place. So I just saw this kind of opportunity to tie it all together. And then I had an aha moment where I thought, well, you know, I'm in the business of branding, social media, digital, and, um, and really kind of capitalizing on the influence of celebrities and fashion bloggers. So why can't I take that and apply it to the social good space? So that's how Up to Good came about. So I definitely believe in um, kind of melding those two together. That's amazing, thank you, Mika. Mm -hmm. Jolene? Um, these are all really amazing stories. I, I, I couldn't even really comprehend the question between how do you separate the two? because it's so much a part of who I am. Um, just a little bit of background um, on me, about me. Um, I am originally from Colorado, um, and as a child of a biracial family, my mother is Latina and my father is Irish. I'm your original Leprechana. 
Uh, <laughs> I'm a black skin, so I get it. <laughs> Um, I had such a blending from the time I was just a little person at this kaleidoscope of life and perspectives. And um, I saw my mom working really hard in her own business and my grandparents, and it was happening at home, at work. There was always it together. So very naturally, I didn't really see the separation between um, work and or personal and professional and particularly when you're really passionate about something I don't know how you shut that off right in the day and say okay I'm done with that now let me go do something else and be passionate about something else um, so no nonetheless uh, I um, then uh, ended up emancipating myself from my family when I was 15 um, and I um, I have a wonderful family amazing it was nothing besides the fact that um, at that time, they had moved to California, they were moving back to Colorado, and I didn't see that for me. I didn't see that as being my destiny. And so, um, had the experience of, you know, really kind of caring for myself while I finished high school, then went on to college, so on. But what does that all mean? I think it means that e when you have the passion to do something, like, I don't see myself being in Colorado I at 15. I, I don't see that as my destiny. Um, and moving to capture that um, is so incredibly important and, and being um, courageous enough to take risks. So I uh, worked multiple places but ended up working for Deloitte Consulting for um, 15, 14 years, almost 15 years. And I thought for certain I was going to retire with the firm. Um, loved what I was doing. I was the national leader for diversity um, for Deloitte. Um, I was dean of our senior consulting program. I sat on our board. I did so many things and I thought, yeah, this is it. And St. Joseph Health ended up being my client. Um, what I loved about Deloitte and what um, I think personally drew me to Deloitte was the organization itself and its values um, and ethics and um, philanthropy was something that just called to me and I loved that. A lot of the things I just mentioned, the roles that I play, that I served and played in were um, internally philanthropic but nonetheless still um, focused on the greater good and when I went to St. Joseph Health um, there was a clear distinction between philanthropy and mission. So whereas philanthropy at Deloitte is a byproduct of the success that the firm has, at St. Joseph Health, every single day of everything that we do is to care for the poor and vulnerable. And um, that just pulled me into this place that um, connected with me. And so, yeah, I, I just I can't even see the separation between those two. Thank you. Uh, so you, you mentioned passion, and th many of our panelists mentioned passion, and I can go down this line, and <laughs> we have <laughs> helping the homeless get um, find homes. We have social conserva conservation, sustainability, so, uh, social impact stories, and really making sure you tie into mission. If we go around this room here, I, I can point out many different friends of mine, and I can tell you this is what is most important to this person and, and what they're super passionate about. However, often it's, it's, it's hard to kind of stay down that path. So we saw with Martine that um, a lot of what she was doing was focused on transition points. Mm. Uh, she talked about transitioning from being male to female. Um, to kind of took us through that story and, and, and what kind of went into that, that decision. Um, so can you tell me a little bit more about maybe some of the values that drive you and also how do you individually see a, a, when you should transition in life? How do you handle these transition points? Um, and, and what do you do to really seize those opportunities? So for start, Mika? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> or oh, sorry, Tina, my, my apologies. No worries. So for me personally, um, a little history about what happened, I guess, before I designed Cardboard Origami. Um, in 2006, I was introduced to Buddhism. And personally, I was an atheist before, and my whole family is. Um, but I am Armenian, so typically all Armenians are Christian, Orthodox Christian. And we're very proud to be the first country that accepted Christianity as a state religion. So everyone you know, practices it by going to church once or twice a year. But we were, <laughs> <laughs> we were atheists. So 
Anyway, I went to a Buddhist meeting and um, what we do is we chant Nam Myoho Renge Kyo. And when I first heard the chanting, it was really interesting to me and I liked it. And everyone has different reactions, I guess, when they hear it. But the philosophy behind this practice is really the dignity of life. Mm -hmm. And so I started studying this philosophy and it's based on the Lotus Sutra. And this is the only Buddhist teaching that says that women and men and all life are equal and equally have the potential to be enlightened. And enlightenment means um, a high life condition. It's nothing really extraordinary. It's just a person who is um, conscious, right? So I started practicing that and immediately the first thing that I did was study abroad. And for me, it was a uh, a big turning point in my perspective on life because I got to witness firsthand third world poverty. And just today I saw a great video on Facebook that showed like, uh, you know, life of someone in America versus life in a third world, you know, country. And it was a very like good a visualization, maybe something that you would, you know, be showcasing on your website of the difference. And for me, I came back to America saying, oh my gosh, I'm taking everything for granted and I want to be more appreciative of what I have and give back. And so it was that trip based on my Buddhist philosophy that inspired me to design this shelter. And ever since, it's really changed the trajectory of my career because I'm an architect and, you know, there's so many other things that architects do, like designing, you know, shopping malls, which is actually what I do by day. Um, shopping malls, mixed use, huge developments for multi-million, billion dollar companies and developers um, that actually they have talking points. We discussed the design. How can we keep the homeless people out of this property, right? And for me, it's like, that's not what I'm about. That's not what I want to do. So I was able to start my own nonprofit and it, it has been successful. We've had overwhelmingly positive feedback and support. And we are actually launching a program this year and we're gonna be helping 10 people get off the streets and stay off. Mm. So that's, that's a little bit about my passion. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Tina. Do you want to go? Sure. Um, so so the transitioning point, I talked a little bit about, you know, kind of getting into the whole documentary thing, but, you know, I think um, just being open to different kind of inputs, you know, so one of, one of a, you know, really influential book for me has been um, The Four Hour Work Week by Tim Ferriss. I don't know if you guys know that book, but that was really influential for me because, you know, of course the four hour work week is extremely attractive, but beyond that, you know, what's attractive about kind of his philosophy that I picked up on was kind of the courage to be unconventional and to question the standard way of being. And, you know, I, take, I took that and it really, you know, helped. It was one of the many things that helped to guide how I wanted to structure up to good. And I could talk a little bit about how I've structured up to good from a business perspective, but it's very unconventional. It's, I don't, you know, um, Freedom is an, another thing that I've picked up um, um, just from that book and just in general, my, my value system. Um, you know, I want to be able to align my values with what I'm doing and I don't want, I didn't want anybody telling me what to do or having to compromise on those values. So, you know, um, for example, with, you know, on that point, um, what we've done is we don't have any investors right now. And it's, it, it takes a considerable amount of resources and, and capital to build the type of platform that we're building. Um, we, we've been at it for about a year, um, but, and we don't have any employees. Um, and so that sounds crazy, how are you gonna do that? But you know, what we've done is that uh, we've structured a gross participation type of an arrangement with all of the partners, um, all of the, the contractors that we work with and what that's assured me and my co-founder, my younger sister is my co-founder, um, is that every person that you know, we bring on board to help materialize our vision is on board with the success of our, our company. We, we're automatically weeding out people that don't believe in our cause. And also, you have to be pretty confident in your ability to execute. And so you know, those are two things that resulted from that kind of commitment to doing things 
differently and kind of sticking to our to our values. Um, also, you know, empathy and authenticity are some values that are very important to me personally and to my co-founder. And I think that you know there are many ways to help the world, right? You can go to um, a benefit and go have a nice dinner and buy, buy a ticket, and I think that's wonderful. I think that you know you can get a T-shirt, you know, and I think that's wonderful. But I think that you know we wanted to kind of do it in a way where people are actually empathizing and authentically understanding what it is that they're helping and feeling compelled to take action. We want to be right there and um, making that easy when you're feeling that emotion. So you know a lot of these things have shaped us shaped us and um, you know I don't know if you guys are familiar with a benefit corporation it's a new kind of legislated structure and we very much believe in that and what it is is that um, it's a type of for-profit corporate entity that puts um, in a legal sense the purpose of your business to be not just financially oriented but socially um, and environmentally oriented in terms of your impact and it specifically and expi explicitly puts that as a legal goal. And so we are a benefit corporation, so those are some of the things. Awesome. Thank you. Um, passion and values. So I am a firm believer that nothing <coughs> happens by chance. Um, it, it's core to kind of my belief system. Absolutely nothing happens by chance. I mean, I as I was watching Martine, it, it, it's not by chance that his her daughter is named Genesis, right? That their daughter is named Genesis. It's amazing. Um, and so for me, I, I think, um, and you hear about all of these stories, you can see how they just connected, right? That there is something greater than myself that calls on me to serve my community. I just know that, kind of core to who I am. I know that that's, that rings true for me. Um, but I also think that there is, you know, knowledge is power initiative trumps knowledge. I think that is such a true statement. I mean, if all of these women, right, didn't take the initiative to build the shelter or think about a new organization or the sustainability, you, you have to take what you're passionate about and then do something about it. Um, but I just, I, I challenge everybody in this room as you have your highs and lows in life um, to think about how you got to that point. And honestly, you'll start to see that nothing ever happens by simple chance alone. Um, Thank you. In terms of, of values, my mom um, managed the money for the University of California system for 30 years. And so she was a financial investor, but she had a mission to her work. It was about making sure that everyone had a pension and that students had financial aid. And so I was raised under that umbrella of you know, doing good while doing well. And when I started my career and I was working at a nonprofit, I was dating a great guy that was kind of, let's say, artistic and <laughs> um, liked to garden and <laughs> build things, but wasn't really making much money. Um, and even though I had this great example in my mom, and this, this um, video really brought this to, to heart for me too, I had this profound experience in about 2007 where I was driving down a country road. I was living in Sonoma County, and I was just you know, thinking about my life and my future, and my future with my boyfriend who I'm not with anymore. <laughs> and I realized I, I might have to be the, the breadwinner in this relationship. And I, even though I had my mom, I always assumed that my male partner would make more money than me. Mm. And so it was a really big, profound moment for me in my 20s to realize that that might not be the situation, but that also to realize that I was perfectly capable of being in that role. And that we you know, put ourselves in, in a box sometimes about what we can and can't do or what our role is or is not supposed to be. So that's really the moment that led me towards kind of business school and wanting to be on the, the business side of, of social good. Um, so that was you know, both the transition and the values that really came together for me um, in, this, in this moment, yeah. 
<laughs> I have so many questions for you, but we have to open up the questions for the, the, from the audience soon. But um, so my last question for you is more of a curiosity question. So in about one minute or less or so, um, what is the most interesting or intriguing question you've ever been asked or asked yourself? Hmm. Really weird question, <laughs> I know that. So. I can go. So um, I think I kind of touched upon it already, but you know, what is happiness to me? You know, what is success and happiness to me? And I think that, you know, I've asked myself that in my journey. And, you know, I've made kind of a deliberate, deliberate choices in aligning, you know, that some of these answers to kind of my life, like kind of creating my life so that it kind of jives with everything. So. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I can go. All right. <laughs> um, so when I was working at the Center for Climate Protection, I had an amazing boss who was just really the spearhead of the, this organization. And about two years into working with her, I thought, I'm ready to do something different. And I uh, found another job, and I went to go tell her that I was going to go work at another nonprofit doing other great sustainability work. And she said, do you really want to leave working on climate change? It's the most important issue of our time. And she you know, kind of backed me up against the wall. And her, ultimately, it was her passion and her vision and her willingness to ask me that tough question about whether I was really willing to leave that. Um, and in the end, I, I did move on to something else. But I always try to find people like her wherever I am who have that vision, who have that intellectual curiosity, who spearhead a cause. And you know, whether or not you're the leader of that passion or you are interested in something, go find those people because they'll motivate you. You can take whatever your interest is and align with that vision and that passion. So that question you know, is another big one for me. I have I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'll go ahead. Um, I think for me, as I mentioned, when I was with Deloitte, I sat um, on the human capital um, committee. And so there were lots of interesting questions that we got all the time about business, about people, about all of those things. And I thought they were all pretty fascinating and impacting to our people and what we were going to do. But it was when I went to St. Joe's, um, St. Joseph was founded by the Sisters of St. Joe. And um, they came from Le Puy, France, and to Chicago. And from Chicago, they received a mission to go to Eureka, California. And so there were these um, women who traveled by train and then arrived in Sacramento. And at that time, and still somewhat today, had to take a boat up to Eureka, California. Mm -hmm. And when they arrived there, amongst you know the 10 of them, they had 60 cents left. Um, and these women were women, you know, probably uh, between the ages of early 20s to like 15, right? All, all nuns. Um, and so I was at this um, formation um, event with other leaders, and they, one of them gave me a small bottle um, wrapped in lace and said to me, welcome to the organization. Here's your 60 cents. What are you going to do with it? Wow. Mm. Yeah. For a six, I mean, it's a $6 billion company today. So they took 60 cents, and you see profoundly the impacts they're making in their community. And to have somebody say to you, and as a new leader, here's your 60 cents. Now, what are you going to do with it is uh, quite impactful. I don't think we could buy a stick of gum for, for 60 cents anymore, <laughs> so that's <laughs> phenomenal. <laughs> so I have a question, I guess, for all of you. So I guess human tendency is to compete, right? We've competed for military power and for money and um, sporting events and all that. But imagine a world where there was competition for compassion. So imagine if we were like, who could help more people in the most efficient way um, and compete to do that? And let's like imagine how that would be and work towards it, I'd say. Thank you all so much for your amazing comments. Yeah. So we're now going to open it up to questions from the audience. Um, we have a mic that's, that'll be running around. So if you have any questions, just raise your hand and we'll bring the mic to you. So that said, any questions, please? Don't be shy. <laughs> Hi, 
We have one up here in the front. Um, so, I'm sorry, it was M Micah, right? Right, yeah. Mika? Mika, sorry. No worries. Um, when you decided you were going to leave your job, how mm -hmm. hard was that to leave, like, the stable job and to start this business that you don't know where it's going to go? Yeah, it was very challenging. Um, I had thought about, so where I was was awesome, right? Um, I think that it was my dream job in the beginning, and I had a really great time. It was a great learning experience to build a company to where it is. Um, but I just had to listen to myself that I, I could do more. And um, so, you know, it was definitely a process. It was really scary for me to just kind of jump off. And I, I would say it was symbolic in that um, right before I officially started, when I was starting it, I jumped off an airplane. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I went skydiving for my birthday. And it was just kind of that moment of, mm -hmm. I'm going to do this, you know? And I think when, when you're doing something like, like this, it does take that leap of faith. And I have never looked back. I've never said, oh my gosh, what if, what if that? I've always been super clear about what I want and um, never regretted it, never worried, never had any anxiety, and I'm really happy with my choice. Thanks. Um, thank you. Other questions? Want up here in the front, please? So uh, this might seem a little bit off the theme, but I'm just really curious about uh, St. Joseph and how your hospital system and your delivery system has uh, reacted or adopted, um, adapted to the post-ACA mm. era with the influx of Medicaid patients. Mm. And um, if you could speak to that. And also, if you could also tie into the homeless population as well, since you said that you, you also serve the poor yeah. Yeah. and the disenfranchised. Yeah. I'm not sure exactly where your access points are, mm -hmm. but how do you address, for instance, uh, ER utilization or hospital admission mm -hmm. for people who are just looking for shelter? Do you have any kind of programs or any kind of case coordination or care yeah. management or care coordination, all these great yeah. words, that help, um, that, that are designed to help these kind of individuals, um, to maybe put them in some kind of ambulatory care center or some kind of a program to keep them out of the hospital and keep costs down, but also maybe gear them towards permanent housing so that they don't have to s seek shelter in a setting that that costs about two thousand or something dollars a, d a night yeah right more than stay at the windham yeah so I'll, I'll try to impact that a little bit because there's lots of moving parts there gosh i could spend the whole rest of the time talking about it um as an organization itself like many healthcare companies we are still evolving um health is under such an incredible transformation I don't think we yet completely understand all of the implications of it. But that being said, our strategy is really much more of what we have described as um, an infinity diagram of population health that when you think about an acute care setting like the hospital settings, that it's no longer just about the hospital setting, right? Most people get well when they're at home or when they're in rehab center, centers, excuse me. So when we think about it, we think about acute care, rehab, into the home, maybe from a home, now you're doing wellness, from wellness you have some other um, uh, diabetes control, whatever it may be, you may then need to see your primary care physician, you may have an acute incident again, and then you're back in the acute care center. But everything around that infinity diagram, we believe as a health system, we need to care for that it is the, the caring of the mind, body, and spirit of the individual that's critically important. So when you think about a homeless population um, and our access point, it's a variety of places. And of course, not only in um, a lot of the um, organizations that we serve as part, of the, as part of the sisters, but in addition to that, in our ERs, right? And so for us, 
Part of the problem too that we're trying to address is mental health. There's a big focus on mental health because you see a lot of people that have readmission into the hospital. Um, sometimes it truly is because of their disease or whatever that pathology be, may be, but sometimes it also is a mental health issue. So there's multiple ways we're trying to tackle it. Their first question around, you know, volume to value, um, and that is kind of the paradigm shift that everybody's now talking about, which was high volume in a hospital, to now when we look at affordable care and all of the requirements the government is putting on that is about value. For St. Joseph Health, this is not a big uh, shock for us, right? Um, the sisters in their belief around um, health care is that health care is a right. It is not a privilege that everybody has the right to affordable care and to be healthy in order to maintain, to your point, their dignity. The dignity of the person is so incredibly important. So when all of this national health care came about, of course, we were thinking it's about time, right? We've been doing this for quite some time now, trying to, one, compete in a for-profit model, but at the same time, focus on what our calling is. And if you talk to, I think, any executive um, or individual staff person at St. Joseph Health, we are ministry before we are a business. Our focus is on care for the um, poor and vulnerable, the underprivileged, and we do that by the services we provide. Um, it also means that we have to make a lot of tough choices, right, around cost structures, cost models, but nonetheless, that's how we're doing it. Hope that, that answers your question. Thank you. Great, thank you. We have time for one more question. Hi, um, I was just wondering, I mean, sometimes we talk about when we have a cause and our mission and how to pursue it, and I was just wondering if there was an example or something about the day-to-day, -day, how do you, you know, you get up one day and you decide, here's a cause I really want to pursue, what, what's the first thing I'm going to do, like, I'm going to walk out the store, am I going to join a company that does that, am I going to make a phone call, and if there is an example of sometimes you made a phone call and they said, sorry, no, did you call them again, and what was your sort of new strategy, you know, how do you just technically speaking and physically speaking approach some yes, of your Yes, yes, and yes, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it's all of those things, I think, quite, quite honestly. Um, but I also think, as I said, you know, knowledge is power. Um, initiative trumps knowledge. And so the first thing, for, from my perspective, is really trying to focus in on what you're trying to do. And then, um, as, as you're doing that, you, there may be multiple paths you, you go down. You just described them, right? Um, it's, it's finding how you're going to make it tangible. Uh, I, I was blessed to have arrived at St. Joseph Health, um, but it sounds like these women here can tell you as well, you know, it's, it's the initiative of and to having courage and, um, and um, believing in yourself. And uh, as I said, nothing ever happens by chance. I actually, you know, wanted to solve the problem that you're kind of alluding to because I would watch all of these documentaries and I was having ADD because I cared about so many <laughs> things that I didn't know what to do with myself. And yet, you know, I, did, I wanted to, I didn't know what to do and I didn't have a lot of time Maybe I'm a little lazy, admittedly. And, you know, but there are people in the world that are experts that know, you know, if everybody would just do this one thing, it would make such a big difference. Mm. And I wanted to give voices to those people through my platform. So, you know, hopefully I could do that. <laughs> That's great. Okay, uh, that's it for questions. Thank you all so much. I'd like to personally thank each and every one of our speakers. Your, all of your stories are inspiring, and I, for one, I, I can't even believe that you've all accomplished half of what you've accomplished. And I hope to, at some point, be able to reach, reach that same sort of epitome of, of life and professionally and personally coming together so successfully. So thank you all, and can we please get a round of applause for our speakers? <laughs>